All right, everyone, thank you so very much. I, 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 was, I love the mobile panels because I think that is an amazing opportunity for all of eSports. The breadth and depth that e mobile gaming offers the community is just second to none. I can't wait to see what happens with more of the, the mobile gaming eSports. So um, with that, I wanted to announce our next session, which is a keynote from a longtime colleague, Tim Fan, talking a little bit about marketing the right campaign. Tim. Thank you. All right, thanks Rob. Um, I'm gonna put a note to myself. If I ever do a keynote, do it really early in the morning <laughs> because it's not as loud as it was yesterday. So I'm gonna do my best to um, make sure I don't get too close or too far back. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, but uh, first of all, thank you for having me. This is my uh, first eSports bar that I've attended and also my first time in Cannes, France. Thank you. There we go, that's me. Um, and so it's, it's a very exciting to be here. I, uh, I'm very honored that you guys have invited me to uh, speak in front of such a great group. Um, how was everyone's day yesterday? Everyone had a good day? Good? Thank you for those who <laughs> showed up. Um, so my talk is very focused around brands. So I'm kind of curious, how many people out there are, are brands? Like you're representing brands, okay. Great, I hope you find this helpful. Um, some of it may already be familiar to you, so if so, hopefully it's a refresher, but for everyone else, I hope you walk away with something on it. But before we get started, um, there's a lot of you that I haven't met, many people I have seen before, but for those of you who I have not met, um, I thought it might be helpful for me to give a bit of a background on my history in esports and some of the work that I've done. Um, very similar to Rob, I have played a lot of different roles in the esports industry. Um, Rob has touched pretty much everything. I'm pretty close to Rob as well. So my journey in eSports started um, in 2003. I mean, I've been playing video games since I was five years old, but in 2003 was when I first experienced true eSports, and that was with the Warcraft 3 community. Um, I started a fan site called WC Replays. Uh, it was the biggest Warcraft 3 fan site of its time. Um, I loved Warcraft 3 Esports. I lived, I breathed it, I was a part of the community. I contributed to it um, so much that, you know, a year later, I uh, also joined a North America professional esports team called United Five. Um, United Five, I don't even know if they're still around anymore, but back then I was managing their Warcraft 3 pro team. Um, I also tried to compete. I didn't place as well, but at least I was a competitor, a semi-pro player for, for a while. Um, but throughout that time, I was also doing this thing called uh, shoutcasting. I know Rob's very familiar with that. And shoutcasting um, is pretty much like radio casting. It was before the days of Twitch and YouTube, so people didn't really see what you looked like. They could only hear what you looked like. Um, and so I did that for a couple of years, and it's, it's the reason why Blizzard took notice of me. Um, they invited me to come out and commentate live at their very first BlizzCon um, in 2005. So that was my first time to play the role of an esports talent. Um, and I was able to travel the world because of it. For five years, I got to travel the world globally, uh, attending some of the biggest esports events, as well as casting at some of the biggest Warcraft 3 events. Um, it, was, it was awesome, but it was at BlizzCon that Blizzard took notice of me and uh, reached out to me to apply to work there. And so in 2006, I joined Blizzard Entertainment. I um, worked as a producer. I started in game development, um, worked on the development team for about seven years. So I touched every single game at Blizzard Entertainment. But my passion was still esports, as with many of you guys. I just kept coming back to it. I kept attending the events. I was you know, spending my vacation to go to as many esports events as possible. I loved it. Um, so in 2013, Blizzard finally decided to expand their esports portfolio. Um, and that was when I had the chance to move over to Blizzard Esports. Um, I was there for six years. I know you're adding up all of these years. You're probably trying to figure out how old I am. I look a lot younger than I really am. But um, I was at the esports, um, Blizzard Esports for about six years. And there I got to lead, produce, uh, and work on the esports of five very different games. StarCraft II, Hearthstone, Heroes of the Storm, World of Warcraft, Overwatch, I had a blast. Um, but 
after 14 years at Blizzard, it was time for me to do something different. And so in 2019, I joined Endeavor, um, where I took on brand, brand management for 160 over 90. Um, and that's where I got to work with non-endemic brands. I got to understand what was important to brands. Um, and one of my main clients was T-Mobile. So that brings us to today and what I'm doing now. And today I serve as the COO of RTS, a company that many of you have never heard of before. And that's totally okay because we're actually planning our uh, public announcement next month. So uh, that's probably why you've never heard of us and why I just spent five minutes telling you what I really do, uh, really did. Um, but you know, we've been busy. We actually formed earlier this year. We teamed up with Sony Interactive Entertainment um, to go into a joint venture. We acquired Evo. Uh, Evo is the largest fighting game championship that's out there. Um, it's also one of the longest standing esports um, events. I think they have roots dating back to 1996 when they were holding tournaments in the arcades. Um, so it's been around for a long time. But aside from Evo at RTS, um, our mission is to help creators, brands, and publishers make a long-term impact in the games industry. What does that mean? Stay tuned in a month and hopefully we'll be able to share more. Um, I'm excited to do so. But why we're here, um, back to why we're here. It's because gaming and esports is big. Uh, I figured some stats would be nice. Most of you probably already know this, these stats. But um, you know, it's, it just keeps, it just amazes me how much gaming and esports continues to grow. Uh, as of today, gaming is now a $175 billion industry globally. That's three times bigger than movies and music combined. Um, you also have esports that has now exceeded $1 billion in revenue, uh, especially as we're gearing up to two of the largest esports events that are happening right now. You know, you have the League of Legends World Championship, um, as well as uh, uh, you know, Dota 2, the International 10, which also features the biggest prize pool we've ever seen, like $40 million up for grabs. That's insane, never seen that amount before. Um, but good luck to the, the competitors who are competing for that. Um, it's crazy. So needless to say, gaming and esports is huge. And a big part of that growth is a new era of direct-to-user direct media. Um, Claire yesterday touched upon this as well. I mean, we're in a world now where we have video creators, influencers, streamers. Um, they all now bypass the traditional methods of building an audience that we've seen before with network television, um, radio, print media. Um, now they have direct access to their viewers directly on their own channels in platforms like these, TikTok, uh, Twitch, you know, uh, YouTube, Instagram, all of that stuff. Like they have so much access to their um, community and it's completely changed the way brands now interact with game gamers and fans and content creators. Um, I think it's important that we highlight this larger creator economy because it's not just video anymore. It's the content creators, it's the social media influencers, it's the private discords, the uh, esports teams, the creator consortiums, um, even Roblox and Fortnite developers. It's basically anywhere you see a niche community, which also you know, I, brings me back to Claire's keynote yesterday. Uh, Claire's with Team Liquid, and you know, she was talking about uh, tribal fandom, um, something that I completely agree with and you see very often here in esports. And so that actually you know, made me think of a quote that um, I really like, it's by Seth Golden, who is an author of a book called Tribes. And he defines uh, a tribe as a group of people connected together um, through a common passion and a leader. And so if you look at our world today, content creators and social media influencers, they're tribe leaders. Um, and they are surrounded by fans that are very loyal to them uh, who look up to them and who will listen to them. And so I think that's very important. Um, at RTS, we believe that we are at a crossroads on how brands and creators coexist. And we want to try and help a brand align themselves with the community through a common passion. 
So how are we going to do that? Um, today, I want to cover three key areas um, and talk about brands, talent, and content. I want to discuss um, paths to success for brands, um, how you should be working with creators specifically. Um, and also, I want to take a look at some of the branded, co branded content that's out there um, so we can talk about ways for you guys to win. Um, as you walk away from this talk, uh, I hope that this will you know, inspire new ideas and it will spark conversation for you as you network with one another. Um, and definitely, if you're interested in this topic, uh, grab me and I'd be happy to talk. So let's start with brands and your path to success. All right, successful brands. This is what they're doing. Um, for the brands out there, it's no longer just checking a bunch of boxes um, to build your voice in this community. Um, it is a true collaborative process. You need to put your trust into the esports team, uh, the, the influencer, uh, creator, whoever you're working with, uh, to resonate with their audience. That's very important. It also takes time, um, as many of you guys know. I think gamers will immediately no notice you know, brands um, that are kind of doing the one and done approach. Like, that's not gonna work. You can't just come in, do an activation, hope it goes well. I mean, you really have to invest the time to learn the space uh, and to determine where you want to be um, activating. Um, and another lastly important thing, I, I think they want to see brands uh, actively, actively engaged and also providing value. You need to provide and add value to whatever the creator or the talent is doing. So before we go into um, how to do this, I thought it would be important if we just kind of align on terminology um, and, and what I'm talking about when I, when I refer to the talent landscape. Uh, first of all, you have a lot of choices. The, one of the First choices is content creators. And content creators can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I mean, there are content creators everywhere now in all sorts of industries. And so when I'm talking about content creators today, um, what I'm referring to is the individual creators. So these are your individual people creating content, live streaming, they're your YouTubers, they're people who are creating content on TikTok and on Instagram. But I'm not trying to ignore the rest of the esports group as well. I mean, you've got uh, pro players, you have orgs and teams, um, you've got tournament organizers, um, on-air talent even, your commentators, analysts, hosts. Um, you also have your publishers. Everyone out there is creating some sort of content. But for, for this purpose, when we're talking about working with creators, I, I wanna focus in on those individual creators. And those are the examples I'm gonna be uh, sharing. So brands, you have a lot of options when you're working with talent. Um, and so I think there are four things that I would want you to take away um, when you are working with creators. Uh, the first one is uh, early involvement. This may seem obvious, but I oftentimes, at least I've noticed on the agency side, it's not. You know, when I work with brands, they tend to either work with their agency or uh, their marketing team to come up with whatever their marketing activation is. And they try to polish it, they get, you know, they refine it, they go back and forth. And then when they book the talent or the creator, they just want the creator and the talent to, you know, share the message as is. Um, oftentimes that's too late. You know, you're giving the creator something that they may not be able to use. So. Um, that's not something that creators really like to do. And I, and I think it's important that if you can, identify the creator that you want to work with and involve them early in the process. Um, you got to trust that they can do what they do best, and that's to create. So if you want them to create something for you, you know, bring them in. Tell them what your goals are. Tell them what your objectives are. And let them help you brainstorm the best way they can market your product to their audience. Which then leads me to the creator's voice, which is very important, right? Leverage the, leverage the creator's voice to deliver the message that you want them to deliver. Don't have them copy and paste your brand message. Gamers can see right through that. And if, ever, if anything, it can be perceived as though uh, the creator is a sellout if they're not really using their authentic voice. Um, so. Trust in your creator's ability to resonate with their own audience. 
Number three, product fit. This is really important when you're working with creators. Why? Because their brand is them. Like they are just representing themselves. And so they have to be more picky than your esports team, than your tournament organizer, or you know any other big platform. Like whatever brand they associate themselves with uh, really reflects upon them. So take the time to identify the creators that are likely going to use your product. Um, as much as possible where it's a natural fit, that's what you, wanna, you want to do because the audience won't be surprised when they are promoting or are talking about your product. Um, you, you wanna avoid a situation where it feels like a product placement. So sometimes it's less uh, important to find a big influencer that looks impressive and it's more important to find a creator that actually is a good fit. And then last, uh, know your platform. I've seen brands make a lot of mistake in this area. Uh, you need to understand the use case for each of the platforms that you're using. Um, I think the biggest one, and I'll highlight this later, is don't use Twitch like a social media platform. Twitch is not a social media platform. It is meant for producing live content. So this means that if you're gonna build your own branded channel on Twitch, nine times out of 10, it means that you're, you really need to go where the audience is. And the audience is on the creator's channel. So nine times, times out of 10, it's gonna be more effective for you to go there than try to bring their audience to your channel. All right, now we're gonna grade some branded content out there. Um, figured it'd be helpful to show examples um, on content so you know ways to win and some things to avoid. Um, so I had to like pull some examples of social media tweets from creators and since our goal is to work with talent and do talent management, um, I went ahead and blurred out who the creators are because I just want you to focus on the brand uh, and less so on the creators. So example number one, um, this is with uh, Norton Gaming. Sorry, I'm gonna have to scoot over so I can see. I know, th I know that the screen is small, so you may not be able to see this, but this is a tweet from a creator, and um, it pretty much just says, for any of you with computers that are struggling a little bit, you should get a Norton 360 for gamers from Norton Gaming. It has a new game optimizer feature that lets you control your CPU usage and other programs so your games can run smoother. Get it here. That clearly is not the creator's voice. Like, I don't even think you need to know who that creator is to know that that is not something a creator would say. That is a copy and paste marketing brand message. And I guarantee you, all of the fans who are reading this tweet just scrolled. They see a wall of text, oh, add, scroll. They didn't read it. So you're, you're probably not getting what you wanted to get out of this, this tweet. Um, so I think you, know, you, you need to really think about the audience that tends to follow this creator. What type of content does this creator create? And is this something that the reader would be interested in? Um, it's also a wall of text. Like, there's already so many hurdles to, that you have to get through to get a, a viewer to pay attention to what you're saying. So don't make it easier for them to lose interest in what it is that you're trying to say. The landscape is um, so much, it's just so different nowadays, and I think companies and brands need to you know, change their ways to keep up. The relationship between a creator and their audience is just more intimate than you know, previously with movie actors or um, musicians. Like They have to engage. There's a two-way dialogue going back with them and, and their fans. Um, so here's an example of a good tweet. And this one might be like, unfair because there's a video asset and you know when there's a video asset everyone wants to click on it um, but what I like about this example and this is with Coinbase I mean look at how this is written you'll thank yourself later true fact in the months leading up to this shoot I wore a diaper every single day to make sure I was completely in character a brand marketing team did not write that that is something that came from the creator um, the creator was given freedom to use his own voice. He was involved early. He was a part of the process on what the video asset was going to be like. Um, 
I don't have the video here, I can't play it, but you know, when you watch it, it's him. He's in the video, he's playing this hilarious character um, of himself aging and getting old. Um, and so this performed really well. A, a lot of people were engaging with it, clicking on it, they thought it was hilarious. It didn't seem out of character. It was something that this creator normally would have done anyway. But because that may seem a little too easy, um, I decided to pick two other examples um, of a creator that didn't use a video asset, but did use a photo. So it's important, guys. Like Images will capture attention, especially if it's an image of the creator. Um, because you know their, their fans like to see new images of themselves. They will comment on how they look. Oh, I love your hair. Oh my gosh, you're so cute. You know, like at least they'll engage with the tweet and maybe even read it. But I showed kind of two examples because one side, you know, there's a little bit of copy and paste marketing, but still you're able to see that the creator had some flexibility with copy. And then on the airhead side, um, you know, she had a little bit more freedom. But what you don't know behind the scenes is, is in this one, there was also early involvement. Um, HelloFresh is a, a brand that basically uh, has prepackaged meals with recipes. You send it out, you can create it. They opted to pick a creator that was a natural fit for their product. And why? This creator uh, was in a relationship and um, streamed very often with her boyfriend um, of them playing games together. They even did in real life um, streams together. So it wasn't out of the ordinary that they would, you know, do something together. And it was actually the creator's idea to do a IRL stream of her and her boyfriend cooking and attempting to make some of the recipes that were coming from HelloFresh. It was very natural, and it was natural for the her and the stream, and people were very interested in it. They tuned in, they watched, they loved the dynamic between the two couples, um, and so that worked really well. And I, that's one of the things I kind of wanted to point out of early involvement and good product fit. And then also on the creators, uh, on the Airhead side, the creator had um, freedom to, um, use her own voice, and then, you know, lastly, images, image photos. Always try to get in there, and, and ideally, it's an image and photo of the creator, not, not of just your product. All right, this next one, um, this one is where brands, I've seen this often, uh, brands looking to bring together different gaming personalities to form their own branded team. Um, and. I think in, in theory, this looks and seems cool from a marketing perspective, because you've brought together all of these great creators, but I think the reality is creators don't like this approach, right? They, they are doing it because of your marketing dollars, right? And um, not because they have anything in common with any of the other uh, creators. And then this is not a bad idea, I mean, I think this, you know, this can work in some ways, but I think, again, this talk is about the perspective of the creators. Right? How are you going to incentivize them to want to build and promote your brand? Something like this does not incentivize them. Right? The individuals get lost in the group. Um, they're also less incentivized. I mean, it's more important for them to build their own brand. So if you're asking them to build a sub-brand of your brand, that's even more challenging. Um, and so I think that's something that, you know, you need to think about where Gillette does well, you know, great product fit. All of these creators are probably users, likely use or, or are using Gillette products. Um, but they really don't have much of anything to do with each other. Uh, and so I think that's just something I wanted to point out. And then um, the last two examples go back to what I mentioned before on knowing your platform, right? Uh, many of you, uh, many of the brands out there want to build a presence on Twitch. And so you guys think it's a great idea to build a Twitch channel with your brand name. I said this before, nine times out of ten, it's not the best approach. And so um, I'm calling out here Samsung US, US because um, they, I know that they've worked with creators and, and have asked creators to come and stream on their channel, but the content that they're streaming is really no different than the content of what the creator would have streamed on their channel. So what makes you think their audience is gonna wanna spend more than three hours on your branded channel watching the same thing that they would rather watch on the creator's channel, especially when they know the creator is, is you know, trying to move the audience. So 
don't try to move the audience where, where you know, it doesn't make sense. Like on Twitter and on Facebook, those are designed for short, short engagements, right? That's great for a brand. So you need to have a brand presence on Twitter and Facebook. But Twitch is the only thing contradictory to that. Twitch is designed for uh, producing live content. So what performs well is long content. You know, anything more than 90 minutes actually performs really well on, on Twitch. Um, I think this is probably contradictory to what you've heard and, and what you've seen in the trend where attention spans of users are getting shorter. But I think on Twitch, um, they buck that because people on Twitch want to spend more time. So I think that's just really important. But I, earlier I did say nine, out of, nine times out of 10. So I do want to show an example where a brand has done it well. So you know, if you are going to take this approach, um, you know, take a playbook out of Bud Light. Uh, I think Bud Light has created a lot of co different content, but the content that I want to call out that has done really well is when they focus in on uh, providing esports. So their campaigns aren't just around creators. They actually added value to the community in some way. They held a um, fighting game uh, tournament for the Tekken and Soul Calibur communities, which didn't have a lot of tournaments in the first place. They found an open space um, that they wanted to work in that no one else was doing, and they, they did that. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. And from the gaming, uh, the fighting gaming community, that was seen as a, a positive for them. And so the players really appreciated it, and the fans appreciated it. So um, Bud Light, good job. <laughs> All right. And so I think that kind of brings me to the end of, uh, of the talk. Um, you know, I think hopefully these key points and examples kind of give you things to think about, um, especially when you're working with creators. Some of it can apply to esports teams and um, you know, publishers, but I think really, you know, the focus for, for us here is to talk about creators. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do to level up brands in esports and gaming, and also to build the right bridge with content creators. And it's uh, one of the reasons why we're building RTS. Um, we've assembled a very diverse team of people with deep roots and deep backgrounds um, in esports. Um, and we, um, we want to really focus on reinventing talent management and the specific needs for our creators and also to help brands uh, you know, find their potential in this industry. So that's it. Thank you. I don't know if I have any time for a couple of questions. Um, if not, I'm, I'll be standing over here and, and happy to chat with anybody. Um, but enjoy the rest of your day. It's a long day with uh, hopefully a lot of great productive meetings and you know, a whole slew of, of panelists that are going to be sharing their knowledge. So uh, thanks again for having me. Awesome job. <laughs>